morning, everybody. Good to see you. Thanks for being here. Great to have you here. They're still trying to find room for a few folks, all right? Uh, they're setting up some chairs down this row. Dave, would you mind setting up a few chairs down the aisle for me right there? Uh, uh, Oh, you already got them? All right, good. Perfect. I couldn't see them over there. It's what happens when you're short, all right? <laughs> How you guys like my shirt today, huh? <laughs> Come here, Sally. Come here real quick. It looks a whole lot better on her than it does on me, doesn't it? All right. <laughs> This is, uh, this is the kids who are heading to Mexico Easter week. This is their fun mission shirt, all right? In case you can't read it from back there, it says, Want a taco about Jesus. <laughs> Isn't that what our sermon series has been since the beginning of the year? Let's learn how to talk about Jesus. And the bottom line, let us pray, all right? Uh, you can thank Teddy for that. That's the creative genius back there to all of it, so... We're going to talk more about why I'm wearing this in a few minutes, but right now I want to direct your attention to the screen to our morning announcements. Hi everyone, welcome to New Hope. We're glad you're here. I'm Jordan Fallsgraf from the High School Youth Group. If you're a visitor this morning, grab that Connect card in front of you and fill it out so we can send you some information about New Hope. And for the members or regular attendees, you can flip that card over for any address changes or prayer requests so we can pray for you. We're glad you joined us this morning. Enjoy the service. Palm Sunday will be a special time for us here at New Hope. Our kids will be performing in their Easter choir, as well as providing the narrative of the Easter story. So come along on Palm Sunday, support the kids, and hear the Easter message from a kid's perspective. Ladies, our walking club is in full swing. Our next walking club will be on Saturday, April 6th at 8 a.m. We'll meet at the Dry Creek Trailhead at the corner of Shepherd and Sunnyside. We're gonna meet on the first Saturday of every month. So come join us. We had a great time. Hope to see you there. Men, we're starting a new Bible study on Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. That starts March 26th, and it'll be in the office classroom. So if you're ready to delve into the Bible, come and join us on Tuesday nights, 7 p.m. Ladies, our Calvin Crest retreat is right around the corner. This is the last week to register. So if you haven't done it yet, go online to calvincrest.com and register today. Our book clubs are up and running. They were a great success last month. The next one will be the last week of March, starting on March 25th. If you haven't joined yet but want to, it's not too late. Go to our church website, choose the book club you want to attend, and contact that group leader. Enjoy reading. Reminder, by auction tonight. 5.30 p.m., right here in the sanctuary. Are you noticing that the women are starting a lot of clubs around the church? They got the book club. They got the walking club going. Men, we haven't started anything. I was inspired this morning because a gift was left for me up on the front pew. I think we should start a cigar club, all right, for the men, all right? And we'll, I'll, 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 I'll lead that Bible study, uh, all right? <laughs> anyway, just kidding. Well, maybe I'm not kidding. Hey, sorry. <laughs> You'll come to all right, Tim. Uh, sign up sheets that are come around are two things on this board. Uh, the top one is if you have interest in attending an information meeting about what it means to be a deacon at New Hope, men or women, deacon, and we sort of threw out the word deaconesses because it's such a hard word to say. But if you have any interest in serving, you want to know what that looks like, there's going to be an informational meeting coming up on April the 7th during the 11 o'clock service. Underneath that is another one uh, about Angel Tree Camp. If you'd like to volunteer, Angel Tree is a, an outreach that Prison Fellowship does. Uh, kids who signed up for uh, the Christmas time gift giving called Angel Tree, uh, they get another invitation to participate in a sports camp. And uh, professional athletes are there sharing their faith and their testimony. They learn some skills about football as well. So if you would like to volunteer, it's anywhere from setting up cones and directing traffic. Uh, what I mean by traffic is kids, all right, from one station to another. Uh, they, can, they, they need volunteers. And so uh, there's going to be one in Fresno. The date's on there. It's in May, I believe. Uh, you want more information, sign up on the back and they will get it to you. All right. Let me highlight a couple of other things. Uh, the women's shirt. Anybody in here got the women's loved shirt on? Anybody? Who? 
<laughs> oh, uh, but anyway, uh, ladies, if you order, we had to, they had to order another batch because they're so popular this year. Uh, if you ordered one, they are out there at the table, and Fawn will be there uh, between services. She will not be there at the end of the last service, but she will be out there between services. If you ordered one, please go uh, pick that up from her today. All right? Thank you so much for doing that. Um, during our 11 o'clock service, uh, where's the picture? Did it get over here? Okay. Uh, if, if you're one of the seniors at the senior luncheon a month ago that signed up to sort of uh, to sponsor a kid in prayer out of our high school program, they're going to have a little meet and greet for those who are here today uh, at the beginning of an 11 o'clock service. So if you are one of those seniors and you signed up to, to be a prayer sponsor for one of our high school kids, hang around until the beginning of the 11 o'clock service, if you would, have a cup of coffee, uh, pick up a dish that maybe you have left here at a previous function, uh, uh, pick it up, take it home with you, and then uh, meet the young man or the young lady that you are praying for, and let them put a name and face to you as well. And that'll be at the very beginning of the 11 o'clock service. Uh, let me just say this, not that it's going to impact you all a whole lot, but there are a few of you in this service who normally are at the 8 o'clock service. So over the next couple of Sundays, I don't want to scare you when you walk in. But there's going to be some uh, a slight remodeling project going on in, uh, in, in the bridge. Um, we had set aside some money at the end of the year to do a few things that we knew were coming up. The lights in there are going out. They're 27 years old. We don't want to spend a lot of money just repairing old lights. And so it's kind of like home. When you do one thing, it's sort of, you're forced to do to another thing that sort of leads to another thing. And if you don't do it now, it's even going to be more expensive later on. So that's sort of where we are in this project. So there's going to be a change out of all the lighting in there. There's going to be a remodel of the back wall, the stage area. Um, there's going to be a major one done once the new building is built and the high school group gets their room back just for them and don't have to share it so much. But a few things need to be done now. And so that will start this coming Saturday, all right? And so the next few Sundays, that room will not look its best, all right? But when it's done, it'll look better than its best has been before. So um, anyway, I uh, thought we would let you know that. That leads me into next Saturday is All Church Work Day. So if you're available anytime between 7 a.m. and noon, it doesn't have to cut off exactly at noon. If you're in the midst of a project, you'll have time to finish it. There are no weddings in the afternoon. Uh, but uh, bring tools, all right? They're going to be repairing some fence out there. They're going to be doing something inside. Some demolition will probably start in that room. Uh, ladies, gentlemen, there's going to be all kinds of inside spring cleaning going deeper. So uh, bring whatever your favorite uh, home tools are and uh, have great fun next Saturday. It'll be the first one I've ever missed, okay? I'm so sad, but... <laughs> I was previously committed when that date got scheduled, all right? So uh, thank you for being here. And if you have any questions, see Teddy Miller, all right? He is in charge that day. Let me highlight a few prayer requests now. Uh, Lilia Mendren is down with back difficulties, and Fred has requested prayer for her. Ron Cross. Uh, Ron's been part of our men's Bible study off and on for several years. Good friend of Barry Pearlstein. Um, he accepted Jesus just a couple of weeks ago here in one of our Sunday morning services. This past week, he went in to have a, uh, a heart pump put into his heart to give him some more time until they can find a heart for a transplant. Uh, it's a very serious surgery. Uh, it has its complications. He is stable, but after surgery, he did flatline. Okay. They had to revive him. Uh, he was never without oxygen to the brain and never was without blood pumping through his body uh, because he had extra support. But uh, it, they said this is to be expected in this kind of surgery. But for, for his wife and for his friends, this is a very challenging time. So please be remembering to pray for Ron Cross. Jim Passini is a gentleman I did his uh, wife's funeral just the latter part of last year. I've known them for 40 years. Um, Jim was doing well when I saw him in January. In fact, so well after we visited, he came to church the following Sunday. Hadn't seen him for a few weeks since I got back from, um, from Africa. And uh, I got a call. We ran at, actually ran into a mutual friend at the home show. He said, uh, have you heard about Jim? I said, no, I haven't. Long story short, Jim got diagnosed three and a half weeks ago with stage four liver cancer. And 
Yesterday, he was transferred from Clovis Community Hospital to Heinz Hospice Home. So saw him late last evening, um, probably will be with Jesus before this weekend is over. So please be praying for the Passini family. Reba has to go for some tests tomorrow, so please be remembering her. Roland Kolb, uh, normally part of our 8 o'clock service, his dad passed away this week. And uh, also Greg Parker's dad, Jack Parker, passed away this week. And so if you'd be remembering their families, I know they would appreciate that so very, very much. So just a few of the updates we wanted to bring to your attention today. Yes, Fawn. I think I did that earlier. I tied, that's okay, yeah. <laughs> I, I tied that in, I think, with the shirts, all right? Go out and get your shirt, pick up your plates that you've left out there, all right? So, thank you, Fawn. Let's pray. Ushers, would you come forward and prepare to wait on us? Uh, I probably should have said this earlier. If you can't make it tonight, you want to participate in the pie auction, write something like a check or cash into an envelope. Right on the outside of the envelope, pie auction. If you write a check, make it to New Hope, but on the outside of the envelope, write pie auction, and all of it will go there this evening. You'll buy me a really nice dessert to take home tonight. No, just, just kidding, just kidding. Let's pray. Father, I love you so much. It's great to be your child. It's great to know that you want to spend time with us. In fact, Father, you never want us to take a moment off from our relationship with you. You want this to be a 24-7. We trust you. We depend upon you. We can't live without you every moment of every day. And unfortunately, Father, we don't live that way. We like to give you vacations. We like to give you days off. We like to... We have this idea in us that we want to make you proud of us by saying, I did it myself. And yet, Father, the passion of your heart is that you are the source of our strength. You are the foundation of our life. You are, uh, you are the one who provides for us the peace, the joy, the happiness, the contentment. You are the one who gives us the words to say. You are the one who gives us the example to share. You want to be the source of our life. Not because, not because you want us to be an obscurity but, Father, you want that for us because you know it is what is best for us. We don't wear out doing good things when you are the source of what we do. We don't have to be afraid of, am I going to say the right thing if you are the source of everything that we say and do. So thank you for forgiving us when we become willfully independent. Thank you for being patient with us as we learn to grow in our trust in you every moment of every day. We trust you with needs today, Father, for those in our congregation that are going through cancer treatment. Thank you for the strength, the stamina, and, and preserving their attitudes as they go through such difficult times. For those like the Kolb and the Parker family, Lord, who's experiencing the absence of a very important part of their lives, thank you for the comfort you give to them. For the Borchardt family and the comfort you've provided in the loss of their son in recent weeks, we just trust you with those needs. Lord, for Ron today... Um, just as, as you repaired his spiritual heart a few weeks ago, I pray that you'll renew his physical heart as he goes through his recovery process right now. Thank you for the way in which you're using Barry and Teddy and others, Lord, to be of help and encouragement to his wife and to him during these days. Father, for what it is that you would love to do in our service today, I hope we give you great freedom to challenge us, not only with the messages that we hear um, through the music, but also the messages from your scripture, Lord. May we have ears that are attuned to your voice in our hearts. May we not dish out what we hear and say, boy, I hope my husband's hearing that. I hope my wife is hearing that. But Father, may we hear your voice in our own life. And then Father, not only hear, but have a willingness to trust and obey. Thank you for the privilege of giving today, Father, and thank you for, uh, I, I simply want to say thank you in advance for what you're going to do tonight as, uh, as, as we are engaged in uh, meeting the need of a mission project, but also supporting our kids, for many of them, their very first time to be engaged in a mission endeavor. Thank you for this and so much more in the awesome name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Turn, if you would, in your Bibles to 1 John, not the Gospel of John, but 1 John the one closer to Revelation rather than Matthew. 
These words in Amanda's song are exactly the theme of today's sermon. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. In other words, grow my faith. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. That's what we're preaching about today. My opening line for today's sermon was originally written like this. Most of us remember. And then it dawned on me. There may be a whole lot of you who won't remember. <laughs> Let me say that differently. <laughs> there are some of you who have never seen this to remember. How many of you have never seen The Wizard of Oz? Raise your hand. You've never seen The Wizard of Oz. My son. Okay, good. Where was, where was your childhood deprived from? All right? All right. Uh, <laughs> we will have to get you educated, son. All right. Good. All right. So then most of you will remember the scene out of The Wizard of Oz between the cowardly lion, Dorothy Scarecrow, and the Tin Woodsman on the subject of courage. In case you don't remember, let me highlight it for you. The cowardly lion says, Courage. What makes a keen out of a slave? What makes a flag on a mast to wave? What makes the elephant charge his tusk in the misty mist or the dusky dusk? What makes the muskrat guard his musk? Courage. What makes the sphinx the seventh wonder? What makes the dawn come up like thunder? Courage. What makes the hot and tot so hot? What puts the ape in apricot? What have they got that I ain't got? And all the others yell, Courage! And the cowardly lion then says, You can say that again. Many people think that in order to be brave or to act in a courageous manner, we must, like the cowardly lion, go in search of something called courage. And that the answer, according to the wizard, is to simply give him a medal, which immediately bestows upon him courage. But here's what I want you to understand today. Scripture teaches us something different. Scripture teaches that courage is not found in our acts of bravery or in a medal but rather it is our understanding of growing deeper in our faith about a big, mighty, powerful God that loves us and calls us to trust in Him. When I was in the fourth grade at Winchell Elementary School, we had that generation's version of games. And there was a group of boys who, for some reason, that to this day I have never figured out, they didn't like me. You, you all like me, right? I mean, can't figure out why they didn't. And it was a, they, they all dressed alike. They wore black turtleneck shirts, black stretch Levi's, pointed toed beetle boots. Remember those? You could kill cockroaches in any corner of the house with those shoes on, all right? That's what they wore. And one day, a half a dozen of them had me cornered in a building at Winchell Elementary School. I really thought that day I would go home with bruises. Just as about things started to get very interesting for me, Rick Barry walked through the crowd and stood next to me. Rick Berry was a fourth grader, but he was head and shoulders taller than anybody else in school at the time. He's the kind of guy that most of us short people hate. Tall, broad-shouldered, narrow-hipped, good-looking. Except that day, I loved Rick more than ever. Because he walked through the crowd, hands in his pockets, stood next to me and said, Tim, how are things? I said, they're better now. Rick went on to be, just so you know, middle linebacker from McLean High School. He was all-valley, all-star at that particular time. Um, and I walked away from there unscathed. Was I courageous that day? Was I afraid that day? I was afraid until Rick Berry showed up. 
my absence of fear wasn't because all of a sudden I had become extremely courageous. My lack of fear that day came because of a relationship that I had. And I think what God wants us to understand that in life, whether it is facing the challenges and the storms of life or whether it's figuring out how can I share my faith with a family member or a neighbor or a friend or even a stranger, that it's not the fortitude of my own stamina or courage, but it is my relationship with God that makes the difference, knowing who is with me. It's easy to grow discouraged in our faith today. If you read a newspaper, it's discouraging. Of course, it doesn't take you long to read the paper today. If you listen to the news on TV, I, I found this interesting. It dawned on me in the 8 o'clock service. Our paper used to be about this thick, and you had two 30-minute news programs at the day, in a day. Now our paper is about this thin, and news never shuts up on TV or radio, all right? It's 24-7, and all of it is pretty much discouraging. Even listening to sports can sometimes be discouraging. When the Giants lose and the Golden State Warriors lose all on the same day, it's very discouraging. But, but, but you and I don't have to put our own, we don't have to go very far. We don't have to go to the news or to the TV or to the radio. We could go to the sphere of our own family, our own church, our own community to discover hard times that have the potential to lead us to discouragement and declining faith. Just in our own church, you've got Dan Sullivan, a 50-year-old dad and husband fighting cancer. You've got Irma, a wife and a grandmother fighting cancer. You've, you've got the Pacini family with the loss of a mom and a dad, probably in less than six or seven months. You've got Ron Cross battling for his life in a hospital heart patient room. You've got the Borchardt family, whose 25-year-old son was shot and killed in Fresno just a few weeks ago. The surge of trouble is nothing new to God's people. The Bible is filled with stories of those in trouble. It's one of the things I so deeply appreciate about God's Scripture is He doesn't sugarcoat anything. It's bare bones honest. He doesn't keep away the frailties and the failures of His own children, and He doesn't paint us a picture that isn't really true. The Hebrew children... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had their fiery furnace moment. Daniel had his den of lions. Joseph was thrown into a, a pit prison. David had to run from Saul. Samson had his eyes plucked out. Paul was shipwrecked and beaten. Peter was sent to prison. And John exiled to Patmos. And James had his head severed. Psalm 34, 19 says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us all from all of them. Storms of life reveal, difficulties in our life reveal some things to us about ourselves and our walk with God. Let me hit five things very quickly. When you and I are going through a difficult moment, we have a chance to learn where we are in our spiritual growth. So, when, when your child four, five, six years of age is homesick, what's one of the first things you do to check how sick they are? Take the temperature. It starts by feeling the forehead. If it's a little warm, then the temperature goes in the mouth or, well, in the mouth, and, and you find out how well they're doing. When storms come, troubles come in our life, it's a good time for us to see how we're doing, how healthy is our faith. The first thing we can discover is what is the nature of our faith? Is the nature of our faith our relationship with God and His Scriptures? Is the nature of our faith in our own self and resources and circumstances? Is the nature of our faith just luck, whims, and wind? However the wind blows is where my life goes. The second thing that we can use to evaluate our relationship with God is the strength of our commitment. There's different kinds of, of commitment in faith here. One, there is the kind that we're, we're fair-weather faithful people. 
when life is good, when my grades are up, when my finances are fine, when my relationships are, 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 are pretty even keeled, then man, I love God. Th then there's other folks who are bad weather faithful people. In other words, when life is going fine, they're not interested much in God. They don't pay a whole lot of attention to Him. It's when all of a sudden the storm comes, they cry out in fear. God, I need you. God, I want you. And then there's really committed folks who say, until death, do us go to heaven. Through the good, through the bad, through the ugly, God, I'm going to trust in you. Then, then there, there's a, the occasion that we can examine our level of our maturity when the storm hits. Do I behave like a baby? Now, listen carefully. If you are a baby, it is okay to behave like a baby. That's normal. Same thing is true in spiritual life. If you're a brand new Christian, the Bible that literally describes you, you are a babe in Christ. You're, you're newborn. And as a brand new Christian, if you whine and cry a lot, it is okay. You haven't figured this out yet. You haven't grown up yet in your faith. But if you've been a Christian for 20 years and all you do is why cry and poop your diaper, that's not a good thing. That's abnormal, okay? Something's got to be fixed. Are you a toddler? Are you a young adult? Are you mature in your faith? I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. Let me highlight two other, two, two other things we need to look at when the storms hit is what's the healthiness of my attitude? And what is the measure of my teachability at this moment? Can I learn as I go through this difficult moment? God, what do you want to teach me? Let me back up just for a minute because I want to highlight a couple of things on this level of maturity. 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. John was the founder of this little church that he's writing back to, this first letter called 1 John. And he says, I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. He's talking, he said, I'm writing to you who are brand new Christians. And I'm writing to you fathers, those of you who are mature, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men. We could say here, young adults, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you have known the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young adults, because you are strong. The Word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. We get a picture of various stages of maturity here. Infants, new converts. Uh, there's no spiritual teeth yet in you to sink into meaty teaching. In a Bible class, this may be the one who gets nothing from the class. If and it happens in here, we don't mind babies being in the sanctuary, all right? How much do you think your baby that you're holding in your arm gets from the sermon on a Sunday morning? Not much, because they haven't even learned how to talk yet. An infant clings to Christianity, but also holds to the natural carnal ways of dealing with life and offenses and is powerless to the passions of this world. I, I thought about this one. Who could I give you as an example of some? I, I, how many of you, you remember Whitney Houston? Oh, could she not sing? I love to hear Whitney Houston sing. I, I love the movie, The Preacher's Wife, that she was in. I couldn't wait for my mom to, to, to see that one. When, when Whitney died, I, I read a lot of her life story. I read every article things I could find. Whitney was one who frequently talked about her faith. She'd been taught as a young person to know who Jesus was. She talked about a moment of inviting him into her life. But faith became less important as fame and fortune became bigger in her life. And she used fame and fortune to try to get through her struggles in life instead of faith. And so her life came to a tragic end because she is one who never got out of the infancy of her faith. Then there's a toddler stage. The toddlers, toddlers still live in a very self-centered world. Me, they can learn though, and they do respond to discipline in a rudimentary, in a rudimentary way. They're able to eat more types of food, but you still have to clean up a lot after them. Toddlers are messy by nature, and they leave a mess wherever they go. 
their childishness, their antics, their messes, their selfishness, it, it, it's understood to a certain degree. They remain part of the family because by nature of rebirth, the sins are forgiven for Jesus' sake. That They understand their brothers and sisters in the church, and they, quite frankly, have gotten to where they prefer them over strangers. They, they sort of get church but these toddlers, they need a lot of patience. They need some discipline and instruction. They need good role models. They need teaching and truth, and they need a whole lot of patience. I don't know if any of you are identifying yourself yet. We're not through. Some of you could be infants. Some could be toddlers and young adults. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, Paul says to a young preacher, flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the name of the Lord from a pure heart. Obviously, Paul was telling Timothy to avoid some battles in his future, not by fighting, but by running. That doesn't make sense to us in our culture, does it? Sometimes we say, stand up and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with it. And Paul says, sometimes, young people, the best thing to do is run. Trust me, if I had not been backed into a corner at the school at Winchell, I would have ran. I, I knew I could outrun them. When you're not very big, you better be fast. But I was in a corner where I could not run. Sometimes you and I need to do exactly what Joseph did in the Old Testament when a beautiful, seductive woman married to the most powerful man in his city tried to capture him in her bedroom. He turned tail and ran. He left his coat behind. He got blamed for doing something he had never did. But he ran. He ran from youthful lust. There are times you and I need to know when to run so we can fight better tomorrow. The strength of young adults is to be found in your learning more and more Scripture. Think about this for just a moment. When do we memorize, look at our own natural age for a moment. When do we memorize best in our life? Yeah, kind of that, that, that 10 to 20 age group, okay? We're, we're going from childishness to young adulthood. Our minds are sharp. It's fresh. As, as a brand new Christian, when we sort of get out of our toddler and we really begin to understand the value of this word, this is where we need to challenge a lot of our energy is into God's word, not just on a Sunday morning feeding, but on a day-by-day -day process. We need to invest time in God's word. We need to get as much of God's word into our hearts, into our minds, even to the point, as we say, I can't too old to memorize scripture. Uh, men, there's a bunch of you guys could give me the name of every sports team in basketball, baseball, and football, okay? You can memorize a few scriptures. And to that spiritual process when we get to young adulthood is when we should be putting more of God's Word into our heart. Mature believers, the Scripture says, because you know Him who is from the beginning. They know God through Jesus Christ. And this Greek word for to know is a word called gnosko. And it indicates that they not only know educationally, but also by personal relationship. They not only possess, possess knowledge of Jesus Christ, but now they have become like him. People will not say of these mature believers, they've always been like this. Instead, people will recognize the transformation of personality, of love, and of maturity to remind people of God. This transformation is seen from one maturity level to the next. And in the mature believer, they have matured past the self-centered inward focus of being a baby Christian. They have matured past the world focus of the toddler. They have matured past the work and task and fighting focus of a warrior. And they now focus solely on Christ, knowing Him and being like Him. Please grasp this. They have passed from focusing on being like Him, which is part of our battle. We try to imitate Christ. But they want to know Jesus so well that he literally becomes their identity. So the nature of my faith, I examine it when I'm going through a battle. The strength of my commitment, good time to examine it when I'm going through a challenge in life. What is the level of my maturity? And is there something about this that I should grow and expand upon? Now, what is the healthiness of my attitude? When I get bad news, what is my first response? Negative? Worrisome? Positive, practical, 
or Christ controlled. That'll tell us something about where we are in our relationship with Jesus. And number five, what's the measure of my teachability at this moment? Am I willing to still learn even though right now I am mad, I am hurt, I am angry, I am frustrated, I am disappointed? Is this a teachable moment for me as God wants to teach me something? Let me look at four things that we can learn from trouble if we're teachable. I love Charlie Brown illustrations, showing my age again. Do, do you know who Charlie Brown is? Okay, good, good. If I had said peanuts, would you know what I was talking about? Maybe, oh yeah, yeah. I threw that out last week and nobody, and then I said Charlie Brown, I got a little better response. Of course, they can't play his Christmas program anymore, right? He's politically incorrect now. I think I found out. Charlie Brown builds a beautiful sandcastle. He's worked on it for hours on the beach. Finally, he's finished, and he stands back, and he looks at it. And it's wonderful, and it's detail. It's just beautiful. And just as he is admiring it, a big gust of wind comes up, and it sends up a wave off the ocean, and it flattens his sandcastle. Now he's standing there looking at mud. And he says to himself, I know there's a lesson in this, but I'm not sure what it is. You ever been there? Could you be there right now? There's a lesson somewhere, but I'm not sure what it is. Now, here's the key. There's nothing wrong with being like Charlie Brown. The question is, am I willing to find out what it is? Am I willing for God to teach me what it is? Or would I rather just stay closed off so I could moan and groan about the problem? Or am I going to be teachable in this moment? Four things we can learn for trouble. Number one, we need to learn the weakness of our own humanity. It was Major Thomas who said it like this. I can't. God never said we could. He can. And always said he would. See, as we approach the troubles of life, it's not about what can I do to figure out how I'm going to get out of this. God doesn't expect us to. He wants us to trust Him. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says, we have this treasure who was Jesus. And where is He if we're a Christian? He is in this earthen vessel. For what purpose? That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us that the answer to the trouble I'm in will be found in my relationship with God. So two things are indicated here in 2 Corinthians 4, 7. First of all, it tells us that we are clay. <laughs> what do you do with clay? You mold it. We are clay in the potter's hands. Jeremiah, I think, talks about that in the Old Testament. We are earthen. We are still moldable. And here's the question when trouble comes, by who and for what? Who's doing the molding and for what purpose? If we will trust in Christ, it says we are clay, what? Vessels. We are contributing. Vessels are something useful that contributes to the master's house. So when we are clay being molded by Jesus, we are also a vessel that he wants to use in his kingdom work in this world. John Piper said, John Piper's a pastor and an author, and he summed it up this way. He said, um, the weakness of our hunger for God is not because he is unsavory, but because we keep ourselves stuffed with other things. Shelly and I made these, and Kathy, assisted, made these apricot pies, fried pies. I like dough, so when Shelly made dough, I sampled the dough. I went to buy the apricots from the fruit stand, all right? I had to sample the apricots before I got home with them. Then I had to boil them down to get them to the consistency to put them into the pie. I had to taste it to make sure if it needed more sugar or no more sugar. And by the time the fried pies were ready, I really wasn't hungry to taste them. I wonder how often in life 
we get filled up with other things in our world and we have no appetite for God. Warren Wiersbe wrote a book called The Victorious Christian about a woman named Fanny Crosby. Crosby was the author, are you ready for this? Of over 8,000 songs. In fact, she wrote so many, she had to write many of them under a pseudo name so she could get more of her songs into a hymn book. At six weeks of age, Fanny Crosby developed a minor ear inflammation, uh, eye inflammation, and she was taken to a local doctor for treatment. The doctor who treated her used the wrong medicine on her eyes, and she became totally and permanently blind from that moment on. Interviewed years later, Fanny Crosby said she harbored no bitterness against the physician. In fact, listen to this. She said, if I could meet him right now, I would say thank you over and over again for making me blind. Because she believed her blindness became a gift from God to help her write the hymns that flowed from her pen. How could Fanny Crosby, blinded by a tragic failure of a careless doctor, still be filled with joy and power in her songs? Because she kept her heart focused on God. She looked upward towards God rather than around at her disability, weaknesses, and circumstances. Like Paul, she was convinced she could do all things through Christ, who was her source of strength. Many of you remember the twilight. I bet you don't know the twilight zone. Show him an episode, okay? It's on, on, it's on TV. In a classic Twilight Zone episode from 1960 called The Howling Man, an American on a walking trip through Central Europe gets caught in a raging storm. Staggering through the blind rain, he comes across a medieval castle. It's kind of a hermitage brotherhood for monks. They finally agree to take him in. Late that night, the American discovers a cell with a man locked inside. An ancient wooden staff is what bolts the door closed. The prisoner claims he's being held captive by the insane head monk, Brother Jerome, and he pleads for the American to release him. The prisoner's kindly face and gentle voice win the American over, and the American confronts Brother Jerome, who declares that the prisoner is actually nothing more than Satan, the father of lies, held in that prison by the staff of truth, the one barrier Satan can't pass. This incredible claim convinces the American that Jerome is indeed crazy. As soon as he gets the chance, he removes the staff of truth. And he releases the prisoner who immediately is transformed into the horned demon and he vanishes in a puff of smoke. The stunned American is horrified at the realization of what he has now done. And Jerome responds sympathetically to the American, I am so sorry for you, son. All of your life, you will remember this night and whom you have turned loose upon your world. The American replies, I didn't believe you. I saw him and I didn't recognize him, to which Jerome solemnly observes, that is man's weakness and Satan's strength. You and I must understand the weakness of our humanity. Number two, the work of hope. 2 Corinthians 4, 8, and 9, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. That's a racing term, meaning pursued, but not passed up. We are cast down, not destroyed, a wrestling term. Thrown to the ground, but not yet penned. Clyde Gordon, who was completely paralyzed from his neck down, edited a magazine called The Triumph in which he said, Christ is no security against storms but he has perfect security in the storm. He does not promise an easy passage, but he does guarantee a safe landing. Does our trouble show the hope that lives within us? People are like tea bags. If we want to know what's inside them, drop them in hot water. What do people see when we are in hot water? Number three, the witness of Christ. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, 10, for we bear in our bodies the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may be made perfect in us, for which we live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also might be made manifest in our own lives. So death works, but life wins. Let me wrap up today with five questions that I think are useful in evaluating our Christian maturity and commitment. Number one, and I'm not going to have time to repeat these. Number one, does my life witness each day to the power of a risen Savior? Number two, 
does my faith in Christ affect the quality of my daily life so that there adheres to it a nobility and strength that is greater than my own? Number three, is there anything in my life that reminds men and women of the master to whom I have pledged my allegiance? Number four, is there any discernible difference at all in my life is contrasted with the lives of those who have never acknowledged Jesus as their Savior and Lord. In other words, if trouble comes to your neighbor's house and comes to your house, do you all act the same way? Paul went, uh, Peter went on to say in his epistle, be ready to give every man an answer for the hope that lives within you. When is hope noticeable? When trouble is present. Do you reveal hope in times of trouble and storm or do you reveal frustration? Number five, do I manifest in the midst of this fever generation a serenity of spirit, a peace which reveals the presence of God in my heart? Do I have peace? And then last of all, it's wrapped up in our worship of Him. When we are maturing and growing, when trouble comes, we find a way to worship God in the midst of our trouble. An eagle knows when a storm is approaching long before it hits, and the eagle will fly to some high spot and wait for the winds of the storm to come. And when the storm hits, he lets his wings out, and he soars above the storm. The eagle does not escape the storm. He simply soars higher by the winds of the storm. Do you remember what Isaiah wrote in the Old Testament? Sometimes I mount up with wings like eagles. When the wind drafts of the storm come, God enables me to soar above the storms. Other times I will run the frustrating race of life and I'll not grow tired. But every single day you can count on this. You can walk step by step and not grow weary. There's a child who was watching a team play baseball. A man walks up to the boy and says, how's the game going, son? And the boy replies, we're losing 18 to nothing. And the man says, don't be discouraged, son. And he did not expect the answer of the boy to be what it was. The boy looked up at him and said, sir, why would I be discouraged? My team hasn't had their turn at bat yet. <laughs> and there are going to be times that it will seem like the score in our life is 18 to nothing and we're losing and you and I need to learn to respond. Jesus and I have not been up to bat yet. That quality of life will be the best way in which you and I can share our faith with others. Is when the storm hits, they see hope, peace, and a teachable life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for life today. Thank you for the challenge you've given us. I hope we've seen something of ourselves and we will be teachable from this moment on. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. Where y'all gonna be at 5.30 tonight? Right back here, that's right. All right, see you then.